Okay, so I don't know what is in the water recently. What Steve Eisman, what dirt Steve Eisman has on every other team where he can just openly fleece several teams. But we have been seeing some bizarre stuff, not only in, you know, free agency to trades, but even at the draft. Ottawa drafting Tyler Boucher at number 10, when many respectable scouts had him in the late second, if not the third round, and he has pandemic complications and a short sample size, but how could there possibly be that much discrepancy between picks? Now, typically when teams do reach that much, it's either a genius move or it completely blows up in their faces, but that somehow doesn't even top Montreal as they would pull an Arizona by drafting a kid who just committed a serious crime while he was loaned to Sweden. What is going on? On top of that, Logan himself explicitly told every team he did not want to be drafted and Montreal would just go ahead and use a first round pick and cause a worldwide shitstorm in the entire hockey community. So with that, in today's video we're going to go over NHL prospects who were flagged with issues. And has your team ever drafted a trouble making prospect? If so, how did you turn out? Comment down below. And if you enjoyed the videos, make sure to press subscribe for your weekly dose of hockey content. Tony D'Angelo. And man, the Tony D saga continues. Back in the OHL days, D'Angelo was a phenomenal talent, as he was developing into a premier puck moving defenseman who was also putting up numbers. And I mean numbers numbers. Because in his draft year, D'Angelo would put up 71 points in 51 games as a defenseman, which is crazy production. I mean, looking back, other than someone like Ryan Ellis, this was one of the most dominant draft years by offensive defensemen in decades. He was on pace for 95 points in a complete season. But you might ask, why did D'Angelo miss so many games? Well, that's my next point. To kick off the season, D'Angelo would verbally abuse a ref, giving him a one game suspension. The guy clearly couldn't control his emotions. Later in that season, Tony would be suspended for eight more games for violating the league's abuse and diversity policy, which means he was either racist, homophobic, or sexist. But the worst part is, it was against his own teammate. Sound familiar? And around this time, it was very evident that D'Angelo had some serious attitude issues. As he was a very confident player, but he hated authority and was even described by OHL staff as uncoachable and just a nightmare to deal with. Which is why, even though the guy was putting up arguably generational stats as a defenseman, 18 teams would pass on him in the draft. The next season, D'Angelo would put up 51 points in 26 games with the Greyhounds. In a full season, he was on pace for 134 points, which would also land him CHL Defenseman of the Year, and at this time, he was regarded as a top defensive prospect in the world. The next season, D'Angelo would light up the AHL, except his attitude issues were so bad, Stevie Y was done, as he would just unload him on the Yotes for a second round pick. So it sounds like a steal for the Coyotes, right? Well, not even one year into his Coyotes career, still producing and developing at a great rate, D'Angelo would be traded again, on top of being suspended that season for abusing another ref. My man was being passed around as if he wasn't a top defensive prospect in the world. And here's the thing, D'Angelo would develop into a great player with the Rangers. In fact, he was putting up points, great analytics, nearly top 10 in Norris voting. Except, just when people were finally thinking, hmm, Maybe Tony is turning a new page. I mean, in my last video, I even thought that. It's been a hot minute since an incident. Psych. D'Angelo during a game versus the Penguins would bobble a puck which led to a goal, which led to him and Georgiev exchanging words. And after losing in overtime, D'Angelo would reportedly jump on Georgiev and start a physical altercation, where his teammates, including Keanje Miller, would have to rip him off. My guy could just not help himself, and this was now the second major incident where he is now mentally abused and now physically abused his own teammate as D'Angelo would be placed on waivers, even though he was a Norris contender. And just today, not only has Carolina had one of the most sus off-seasons I have seen in years, but they would sign the troubled D'Angelo to a one-year, $1 million contract. And what's ironic, they did this right after trading for Ethan Bear, who represents and is a face of the First Nations within Canada, and of course, anti-racism. Now, of course, by no means am I saying or 
inferring that D'Angelo is going to come in and start something with Bear. It just seems so ironic and just mind-boggling that those two worlds would collide. Ethan Bear represents the direction we need to take in this league. And D'Angelo, the direction that ruins careers. And you know what? I really hope so. I hope D'Angelo has reflected heavily on his actions and has actually turned a new page. We all believe in second chances, but what is this now? His sixth, seventh chance? How many chances does this guy need to not be a garbage person to his team? As it is very evident, and he has shown it consistently, that he cannot control his emotions. I mean, you're making millions of dollars, you're living the life in the NHL. One thing happens and you're willing to throw out your entire career? It's, it's wild. Because the thing is, the dude is clearly a great talent. And he's wasting his career, his potential, and his talent because he has a piss poor attitude. Being in the NHL is a privilege. But what do you guys think? Was this a suspect signing? Do you think he will actually change this time around? Or will he be in another headline by the end of the season? Edmonton Oilers are so proud to select Nail Yakupov. When Nail Yakupov was drafted, he was described as an electrifying, dynamic, goal-scoring winger, not much defense, but Nail had an unbelievable offensive tool set. Which led scouts to start drawing comparisons to players like Alex Ovechkin, Ilya Kovalchuk, and even Pavel Bure. And to be honest, I don't even blame those scouts, because contrary to popular belief and recency bias, Nail Yakupov was a great talent, who just so happened to be putting up incredible numbers. The year before his draft year, Nail would put up 49 goals, 101 points in his CHL rookie season, and this production made scouts salivate. Because even though there was rumblings of Nail not listening to coaches, being selfish, not putting in the proper work, it didn't matter when you were scoring at that rate. Except, Nail was raw. He was a raw talent, he was not refined, and relied heavily on his natural talent. Flash forward to 2020. Ryan Burke on the Spin Chicklets podcast would come out and say this. His draft interview was the worst interview I've ever had in my life. Oh, How come? Jeez. Because he was defiant and obnoxious and sullen. and So John Lilly almost fought him in the interview. <laughs> the worst draft interview he had ever experienced in his career. So flash forward to the NHL. Neil Yakupov is playing okay. He isn't progressing. In fact, he's declining. And the thing is, when you are a great natural talent and effortlessly lighting up kids your entire career, many prospects fall into the trap of developing a massive ego. What do you mean, coach? I don't want the back check. I score goals. And this was the downfall of Yak. Now, Dallas Eakins and Neil Yakupov had an extremely rocky relationship. In fact, Neil Yakupov was rumored to just straight up ignore coaches and displayed major, if not concerning, attitude issues on many occasions. Because here's the thing, when you are a raw talent, you need to listen to coaches in order to develop and see actual development. And if you don't, you are walking a fine line of becoming a massive bust. Which only makes more sense when you consider his horrendous draft interview. I mean, to sum it up best, my coach, and I'm sure many coaches used to use this saying, you think your shit don't stank. Which is why character is so important in the NHL. And in Yakupov's case, all of the warning signs were there. Now, do keep in mind, especially with athletes, passion turns into attitude real quick. But when you walk that line of passion and constantly go into attitude, it can lead to many internal developmental issues which was only magnified by the Oilers' horrible management during that era. Robbie Shrimp, arguably the most skilled prospect in NHL history. The dude was pulling these moves on a night-to-night -night basis. Disgusting. I'm Shrimp. A little fake here with the back leg and then right up top. In his rookie season in the OHL, Rob would put up a very impressive 74 points. The next season, he would kind of stagnate as he would put up 69 points. Except, his hands... His skill set were so crazy, he was literally in a different stratosphere in terms of CHL talent during that era. Which makes sense why the London Knights would acquire him as he was an attraction and he basically played in an NHL rink during his time there. And even though he was a horrible skater, played zero defense, he would still get drafted 25th overall by the Oilers. And would finish his OHL career, and get this, with 57 goals, 145 points on top of putting up 47 points in 19 playoff games that season. Ridiculous. However, being that dominant has a massive downside. You stop trying. 
In Shrimp's case, it was reported that at this point, he did not put in any work to improve any other areas of his game. The guy had the skill set of Patrick Kane. And I mean, to put this into perspective, the only player who's come close to Robbie Shrimp's numbers in the past 20 years was Patrick Kane. He was full gas, full send offense, and zero effort on the back check, and wasn't willing to put in the work. He developed an ego, wouldn't listen to coaches, as he basically thought that his skill level would carry him to the NHL, and he did not have a hold over his emotions. In fact, my guy would even have a meltdown and attempt to spear a fan in the crowd. Wild. And as a result, Shrimp feeling like he was on top of the world with his crazy skill set, would develop into a severe one-dimensional player. And well, when you play against the best players in the world in the NHL, you get a reality check, as all the holes in your game will get exposed in 4K. Because even though Shrimp was arguably one of the most talented prospects the game has ever seen, he would not change from the time he was a teenager to his last game in the NHL. He would fail to land a spot in Edmonton as he did not progress, would go to the Islanders, he would get more opportunity, but when you are a one-dimensional player, your only hope in the NHL is if that one dimension is very elite. I mean, even think of Patrick Laine. If the dude wasn't scoring, you know, 30, 40 goal paces, he would not be in the NHL. And for Robbie Shrimp's case, he was not scoring anywhere near that pace with 25 points in his best season. He would get shipped to the Thrashers, and once again, all of his holes would be exposed in a new light. And as a result, that would be Rob's last stint in the NHL, as he would spend the rest of his hockey career in Europe, bouncing around several teams. And Robbie Shrimp, I don't know why, I just like saying that, Robbie Shrimp, alongside of basically everybody in this video, is a testimony to why character and attitude is so important in professional sports, and why NHL teams put so much value on it. When you don't listen, you're basically telling your coach you're not willing to grow as a player. So the moral of the story here is, attitude issues can be the biggest detriment to any prospect's career. Even if you have all of the skill in the world, case in point, you know, everybody in this video, even if you're putting up generational numbers, if you can't fix your attitude, you are single-handedly your own worst enemy. And the thing is, these players exist in every draft and will continue to exist. Sometimes they do grow as a person and do fix these issues, but when they don't, it often ends in complete disaster.